All right, everyone. Welcome to the HI vodcast off script. Um, it's Vanessa Partley, and I'm, I'm Bill Wong. We are your co-hosts for today. And uh, and as always, we begin with kind of the reading of our HI vodcast preamble. Just some some contact setting and some thoughts that we have, and kind of the impetus for us starting this vodcast. And there are basically five bullet points. One, I think, is a question. What do we really want from artificial intelligence? And that is a question we just want to pose to ourselves and to for all of us. Two, we live in a time when advancements in AI technology is shaping our world while critically outpacing our understanding of this technology in various humanistic contexts, be that, be that cultural, social, ethical, historical, and others. Three, look at us. We're Stanford, one of the most powerful academic institutions located in the heart of Silicon Valley. And yet, it is all too easy to be in a profound bubble. Much of the world knows and cares about AI far less or far differently than what we might assume. It is also all too easy to be sure of ourselves as the technology creators while remaining out of touch with the rest of the world. We tell ourselves that more technology is the solution for technology is what we know and we are eager to apply our craft. Unfortunately, it is all too easy to do so with a shallow understanding of the social, cultural, historical contexts, while not even considering the possibility that problems in the world are seldom lack of the technology problems, but entrenched human problems, including technology itself. But of course, we keep moving fast because that is often good for business. Even when we design tech for social good, we off, too often just end up making something slightly more convenient because slightly more convenient fits the prevailing economic narrative. This is the bubble, the technology cave we don't know we're living in. Four, we need to interrogate ourselves to better understand how we as individuals and as communities would want to live with AI technology and through our creations, how we might want to live with one another. We will seek distinctions between intelligence and wisdom, working definition for intelligence. We say that, well, that's, basically having the means to achieve what you desire. The wisdom, on the other hand, is having capacity to assess your desires in the first place and to assess the means you would have to achieve those desires. So we ask again, what do we really want from artificial intelligence? And there's a, and there's a number five here. And above all, what does it mean to do AI with heart and compassion? Thank you, Gus. So um, today's topic, for those of you who haven't been with us before, each podcast we focus on what do we really want from AI and some topic. Today, we are talking about um, education. Uh, so a, as AI research has developed, as foundation models have become more and more capable, um, there's a lot of questions about what, how do we educate the next generation and, and what, what needs to shift, what shifts need to be made. Um, especially, this is Gus's first episode since becoming a father, um, we thought it would be good to focus on um, early education. That's Ava, 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 Ava. Um, so we today we are going to dive into what it might look like for our kids to learn in a world surrounded by AI, but then also from the opposite perspective. What can we learn from how babies and toddlers learn? Um, their curiosity, and how that might better inform AI. Um, so with that, I guess we'll we'll get started. So Guff, first, let's talk a little bit about what has been your, on your mind since uh, December. Well, yes. Uh, so uh, I've been a parent now for all of uh, not even 12 weeks. Uh, I must say it's been a huge blur. Um, and uh, but there are a lot of things that continue to circle around my my mind. Education, obviously, the huge, huge one of the huge e words. I think that's on, on my brain. But also, I'm just I'm just thinking about the future, of Vanessa. I'm just I'm just looking, trying to gaze into into the future. And I, what I'm wondering about is like I'm just like I'm just I want to know even just a little bit more about what kind of a world she's going to be growing up into, and. And I'm finding that is so hard for me to to actually gauge. Like I don't I don't know anything about anything. That's how I feel right now, um, and even less about what the future might hold. But whatever that future is, 
my feeling right now is that it's, 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 I think it's going to be a future that I can barely imagine. That's all I've, as far as I've gotten. And, um, so 11, 12 weeks in, that's, that's, that's where I am. Oh yeah. I mean, I will say I have one kid, he's three, Emmett, mm -hmm. I've had him before. Um, I think that's normal. You yeah, just I need, don't know what you're doing at all. So that that's somewhat comforting to hear. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm curious as to, you know, I mean, being a, you're ahead of me in the, in the parenting, like, uh, a parenting game by, by a few years, by three years, yeah. any, um, I guess, well, a few things I've been thinking about, well, a few experiences I have had in regards to kind of like education. One is, um, you know, we are, we're thinking about, I mean, he's three, um, but we're thinking about like, oh, what do we do for elementary school? What, what school should we like, do we need to move to a different school dish, all that, like, and maybe we're over preparing. I don't know. Um, but so we toured a certain private school to see how we felt about it. And, um, you know, they were saying all the right things that I guess stereotypical Silicon Valley would, you would expect the parents to be excited about for kindergarten. Um, but I had the opposite reaction. So we go in and the person telling us about how the kids are a whole grade level ahead in reading and they showed us their little robot and they're like, oh, like kindergarten, they start learning how to code and like all these things. And I was just kind of like, oh, like, does he need to learn how to code in kindergarten? And um, also like now there's generative AI, like what's, does he even know how need to know how to code at all? Like, I don't even know. Um, so anyways, it was, it was just a, an interesting experience. Um, and then I guess another thing, especially working at HAI that I, that keeps popping into my head is, um, you know, how, how the kid, how the kids learn and how it, how, how AIs learn. So, you know, we, there was a project, um, a research project that spoke at a seminar a few years ago. Emmett was like nine months. He's like army crawling around. He couldn't really like crawl and he's like rolling to like get where he needs to go. And uh, this research project was um, by Agram Gupta, Fei Li and Surya Ganguly around like uh, evolution. And they had um, simulated agents in environments um, and they had like different arms and legs and tall or short, and they had put them in like flat environments or bumpy, or they could move things around. And they looked at like, what type of environment did these agents learn best in? And it turned out they learned best in these environments that are like very different and bumpy and, and blocks and stuff. So I see like my kid trying to like army crawl and I'm like, oh, like I need to get him into like a complex environment and that will like teach him to like, you know, he'll be smarter that way. I mean, granted, that was like evolution, like much longer than one kid's few months. But um, oh yeah, these are the little like agents that were. So um, like, yeah, you can look it up on our website. But oh, and that's Emmett. That's Emmett. Yeah. So that's super fascinating. And I'm just like, oh my God, that's the world we're, <laughs> that's the world we're currently living in. And that, that, that you know, our, our respective kids are going to be, uh, be growing up in. So I, I mean, I'm just like, I'm trying to figure it all out. I mean, this is super interesting. Yeah, I'm, I've, uh, yeah, I tried reading this too. It's a, it's a good book, actually. It goes through the. It has those as well. It's a, it's a must-have. You know, it's a really kind of the very basics of like supervised learning with a multi-layer perceptron. I'm like, okay, so this is how. Yeah, this is in, in language that well, my my daughter's not yet ready to uh, to receive. She's still like into the high contrast things of the world. Um, but yeah, I'm like driving around town, Silicon Valley, and I'm like, I'm driving by elementary school to offering, you know, coding and AI camps for kids. And I'm, I'm having the similar kind of questions you do. On one hand, I'm like, do I need to get in on this race? Right? This is a race, right? Because we got to get our kids prepared for college now. She's what, three months old? She's got to start right now. So there's that. There's another side of me that is like questioning that first side and be like, wait a minute. Uh, when I was young, what was I doing? Well, I was born in Beijing, in China. There's me with my uh, communist hat, I guess. And here's me saying, check out this rock. And there's a part of me that's wondering, well, won't they have like the rest of their lives to try to figure out all this other stuff about coding and AI? And in the meantime, isn't it about like, I don't know, get in touch with nature, about the, the sticks and the rocks and the dirt outside? 
um, I don't know, questions abound. This is this is kind of, I think, I think, I think this, this brings us to, I think, our, our episode today. Yes. So let's, <laughs> um, with that, we will invite up our two guests today. They are both from this Graduate School of Education. Um, first is Sarah Levin. She is assistant professor in the Graduate School of Education and is interested in the way that AI and digital media can be used as frameworks for teaching, reading, writing um, for middle and high school students. And then before um, her academic career, she was actually an English, taught English at a Chicago public school for 10 years. Welcome, Sarah. And then we also... And then we also have Nick Haber. He's also assistant professor in the Graduate School of Education and by courtesy computer science. So after receiving his PhD in mathematics and partial differential equation theory, he worked at Sension, which is a company that applied computer vision to online education. And additionally, his research group develops in artificial intelligence systems meant to mimic and model the way that people learn in life, exploring their environments through play, social behavior, and curiosity. So um, we have both of our speakers are from the Graduate School of Education, but actually research kind of these two different edges of education, um, which I find quite interesting. So with that, we will go into our first segment. So again, every episode, we do these origin stories where we learn about um, our speakers and, and where they come from. Uh, for this episode, we decided to show childhood pictures given the, the topic. Um, so we'll go to the first one. And Gun, I also included ours as well. So this is Gun. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a music professor uh, right now. So I guess this is, this is one of my first instruments. It's an accordion. This hotshot accordion teacher rolled into town in Beijing, said, hey, parents, grandparents, your kids need to learn accordion. So for like two years, my grandfather lugged this accordion to like the middle of the city and we're in the same room as like 22 other like seven-year-olds. Imagine this, 22 novice accordionists playing in unison on the on 22 accordions. It's a sight to behold <laughs> um, and a sound to behold for sure. Mm -hmm. But also, I, you know, I grew up with my with my grandparents. Now, that's me at the age of two, I believe. Oh, so cute. Yeah, so this is me. I'm 11 months old, and that's also with my grandparents. They lived in Florida. So that is us there. And then the picture of Emmett before was also, um, he was 11 months too, so we were the same age. Um, and Sarah, do you want to go ahead? Uh, it took me till I was 10 to stop sucking my thumb. I tried every possible technology, including dipping the thumb in vinegar and <laughs> so many, but it took me quite a while because, you know, it's kind of nice, kind of nice to have a little something. Uh, so it took me a while too. And like, I would just suck the flavor off. And <laughs> I was thinking about, uh, look at this rock. And uh, if you were to, uh, un uncrop that picture, you see there's a giant newspaper in front of me. And I grew up in a house with lots of books and lots of reading and lots of paper, um, different kinds of technologies. And I, I know that those technologies uh, informed why it is I'm interested in studying uh, English language arts and reading and writing. And now more recently, the new technologies and how those things influence uh, middle and high school students in terms of how they think about writing, what writing is to them, um, and how they will want to learn about writing, given that we now have machines that can do that writing for them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's, uh, that's me uh, 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 eating peanut butter uh, out of a jar with a spoon. Um, not with my hand, which is a, I guess, a good starting point. Um, I kind of think kind of similarly, maybe with uh, sucking on thumbs, uh, this is a habit that is died hard. Um, I think uh, it took me until maybe graduate school to stop uh, eating it with my hands alone when I had no other implement. And, um, and I still have to basically like not have Skippy in my household, otherwise it's going to be a big, a big problem. Um, it's, be best. it's, I mean, it's just candy, just candy to me. Um, maybe kind of tying it into to childhood learning. I think, um, well, I mean, one thing I think a lot about is that is the drives that children have early in life and how it influences their learning. Um, 
uh, eating Skippy is certainly an uh, instrumental drive, uh, a lot of calories in that, um, but also like very interesting. It's an interesting substance uh, to, to, and, and like the experience of, uh, you know, digging into a jar and, 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 uh, and playing with it is, is, a, is a fun one. Um, so. Um, so Nick, I'll start with you, given okay. um, you talked about kind of the drive, what drives us to learn. Um, so you work on kind of how AI agents mirror, like how infants learn. Um, can you talk a little bit about what is special about the way children's, children learn and, and why might applying those learning techniques improve artificial intelligence? Yeah, okay, great. Um, and I guess, I mean, maybe it's useful for me to say a little bit first about like, um, you know, like how I think about what it means for taking, you know, our understanding of how humans learn and turning that into uh, understanding of, of, of uh, a, a, a better understanding for how to build artificial systems. And I think that there's, there's like a couple of ways you could approach that problem, right? Um, from one perspective, you can think if I, oh, if I understand how a, how a child learns or how we learn broadly, um, if I understand a precise mechanism of that process, um, then I can try to build that into an artificial system. Um, uh, it turns out that that's, that's quite hard. Uh, the way that we learn is incredibly complicated. I mean, for those of you who are familiar with Rich Sutton's uh, bitter lesson argument, you know, it, it, this is nothing new. Um, it's, it's hard to understand like precisely the mechanisms we learn and build that into artificial systems. Um, we make progress with that, but, but it's, it's challenging and, and, and can kind of often lead to, to challenges um, uh, and, and difficulties and, and dead ends. Um, there's another way, which is to say, let's try to understand how, um, how people learn and how children learn and use that as sort of a North Star. This is telling me the engineering requirements for making an artificial system. Um, it, it tells me what intelligence is um, and what to aim at. Um, and that's kind of more the direction that I look at. So um, when I think about um, the, the, the power of, of childhood learning, um, I think of this um, you know, simplified picture, but I think very useful picture. Um, you think of a child, as, as I said before, uh, regarding peanut butter, um, having a uh, drives. Some of these drives are instrumental. Um, we want to, uh, we want food, we want water, uh, we we want uh, to stay warm. Um, but some of these drives are are are, are different. Um, they might be, for instance, informational. We want to control our environments, understand our environments. Um, some of these drives are are perhaps social. We want um, good reciprocal interactions with others, for instance. Um, and and uh, and, and with these drives, a, a child you know, has all these sorts of learning behaviors early in life and this incredible capacity to build models of their world that don't come ready-made when they're born, but through learning about their world, but through gathering data and building these models, they, they, come to, um, they tend to have more and more sophisticated learning behaviors. Um, so it's that incredible blueprint that children represent of these uh, driven agents that have this capacity to learn um, that I find so fascinating and, and, and attempt to replicate in artificial systems. We talk at HAI about like augmenting versus replacing humans. So do you feel like in, you know, you're, you're working on learning how children learn to make the system, like, are you thinking about what children are good at versus machines are good at? Mm. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. And certainly like, um, you know, there are all sorts of ways in, in which uh, we can think of augmenting people by, um, by developing artificial systems that can, you know, do certain sorts of tasks much better than we could hope people to do. Um, but we can also think about um, uh, using artificial systems to either better understand how people learn and support that process, um, or build, build tools to help people learn to help to help scaffold that process. So I think, I mean, largely, certainly, I'm on the, you know, augmentation side, I don't want to, like, you know, build an army of AI infants. Uh, but but I but what I you know what I want to do is to make these sorts of technologies so as to give us new tools to help us learn and build, um, and um, and 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 help us learn and thrive better. So I'm kind of curious. What would be like might be like a like an example of of such an agent, and also this I guess the part the second part is something I think you started to answer is that I'm kind of curious as to what you feel is like the. Uh, if we can call it an end game, if you will, kind of the what if everything worked as you hoped, what does that world look like with these AI agents in them? Yeah, I mean, okay, well, second was a hard one. 
I mean, okay, they're both hard ones. Um, but but let me, let me have a go at them. Um, yeah. So I think uh, there are. I, I mean, that there are several such <laughs> such agents. I think they can. Um, you know, one learning uh, one one uh, research program that we have here, and it's an objective shared with me and many others, is to try to as closely as possible model early human learning through making an artificial system. And that's not to make a tool that um, can necessarily like uh, do anything in particular, except it then helps us to better understand um, both really early childhood learning, um, what happens you know, wh when you know, a child is put in this environment with this background, um, to understand really the diversity of, of, of learning um, and, and potentially to, to help understand how to you know, make people better learners to give them the right sorts of environments. Um, uh, so, you know, and that that's a kind of like, you know, a, a, a long term moonshot, we want to make that artificial infant so that we can better understand our learning processes. Right. Um, but then we can think about making artificial uh, systems that can mirror certain aspects of learning processes um, better. Um, I guess to give a couple of, of examples, one of them is quite old. Um, uh, it's it was in something I worked on in uh, uh, 20, 20, starting like 2014, um, we called the uh, Autism Glass Project. And um, the, uh, so, so this was, um, you might, might remember uh, Google Glass. It was briefly loved slash hated in around 2014. Um, and um, well, we, we had this idea for trying to make a learning tool for children with autism. Basically, they'd wear the device. Um, it would recognize social cues and their surroundings using artificial intelligence. Um, and and give them feedback in in real time. So this is creating artificial intelligence that mimics an aspect of our intelligence, um, and 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 uh, basically converses with with the user in order to help them them learn. Um, so I think then you get right. So so you get these like you know more more limited devices where you're trying to basically take a a, a portion of of how people learn, um, and uh, and and use that to to scaffold the process. Can I ask a quick question? So I've been I'm teaching an undergrad class in in uh, race, language, ethnicity, and education, and we looked at a lot of different definitions of learning. Mm -hmm. And when I think about uh, AI and all the, the 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 fake clone babies that you're building down in the basement, <laughs> I, I actually didn't know about until now. <laughs> um, which so now I know not to go down there. Um, do, when you think about when I think about AI, I think about learning in kind of behaviorist terms. That is, learning defined as a change in behavior based on experience. Yeah. And when we think about educating human babies, um, we think beyond behaviorism to you know social, social, cultural learning, connected yeah. learning, distributed learning. So, how do you think about What's the model of learning behind, you know, behind AI for you? Can it ever be more than just a change in behavior based on experience? Yeah, I, I mean, it's 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 interesting. I mean, I do think that, right, like um, our models for what learning is becomes a function of the sorts of technology that we have to play with in the current era, right? This is always the case. Like, a, you know, we, we use, you know, learning is a metaphor for blah, right? Like, um, uh, but um yeah, I mean, I think um, I, I guess I think of of learning as as being um, yeah, in part a a behavioral thing. How a a system is a child is interacting with with something, uh, so as to collect data, uh, build a build a model of their environment. But but in saying that, then um, there's a second component, which is that you, you're building a you're building a model. You you have um, something, some representation of the world that you're internally developing. Um, which then allows you to flexibly do all sorts of new things, and that's kind of like the second component. You have these 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 behaviors um, developing representations, um, which which can be used for all sorts of capacities as you go forward. Has 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 this made you think that humans are more like robots than you used to think? <laughs> um, uh, are, are yeah. I mean, I guess I, I don't. I guess. Um, as as currently stands no but i guess i um see no particular reason why we couldn't try to build these sorts of things and in in silica and then either learn why we shouldn't do that or like can't you know 
what, why we can't do that or learn a lot more about how we learn through the process. Yeah, so. I just, had to, <laughs> just want to know if we're, if we're all doomed or not. <laughs> yeah, as much banter. Um, we'll do questions at the end. No problem. Looks great. Um, do you want to, do you have any final or? No, I'm just like, my brain is kind of trying to process the idea of like art of AI babies. And I wonder like, will my daughter be playing with an AI baby to help her learn? Or is that like a, is that, is that a, is that part of the end game? I guess I'm trying to, I'm, doomsday mover, like the is this a doomsday thing? Or is this, yeah. 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 Are you, yeah, you're asking about end game. I, I think it's so hard to, to kind of predict like what, you know, where, where these sorts of things will, will go. I do think we want to make devices that are like better and better at, at augmenting our learning processes and reacting to the new sorts of tasks that we do, uh, you know, in our lives as we, you know, incorporate these powerful new uh, cognitive tools such as artificial intelligence. It's, I mean, that's, I guess the question in my mind is always like, what does it mean to learn better? Yeah. Right. Because I think that's maybe that seems to be part of the key here, because sometimes I feel like learning better means doesn't mean actually like everything is understood. Learning better sometimes means having the right amount of resistance, frustration, confusion. But that can hopefully mean the right amount that leads to certain kinds of curiosity that then turns into some understanding. But that understanding is in a way, it kind of feels like it might be earned through the confusion and all the initial resistance. Mm -hmm. That's from someone who has, I, like I said, I know, I feel like at this moment, I know nothing about anything. Mm -hmm. So, but that's, these are the words that are forming in my head at the moment. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that's, you know, kind of what, what, what for you does it mean to learn better? I feel like Sarah, you might have thoughts on this too. Well, let's have Nick start and then yeah, you know, I'll just jump in if yeah, I yeah. Tell me. If you've got it working. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. I know. I, I think. Um, uh, no. It, yeah. Uh, let, let's see. So. So. Um, yeah. I mean. I think. I think learning better. I mean. It's a. That's a like a, a fairly coarse notion, right? Because I think. Um, right. In. In some sense, you want to understand like, well, what what should you be learning? And there are many possible things you can be learning. Um, but coding came up before, right? And I won't advocate for you know, teaching a three year old to learn how to code, um, but. Um, but I do think like, you know, when you're, when you're teaching someone how to code, and I think this is really salient because of all of the, uh, generative AI tools that we, we are now seeing, um, you know, uh, there comes a question of like, okay, well, what should you be teaching them? Right. Um, uh, I, I think, and in some cases, maybe you want people to learn how to, you know, do basic coding to actually manipulate symbols and, and, and make good syntax and, and make good programs. Maybe you want to teach them how to uh, engage in the higher level reasoning processes that people um, that people uh, engage in when they're making things. Um, and and um, technology can can scaffold those learning processes in, in different ways. Um, um, so in technology enabling us to, to learn better, I you know, think of it being a tool for allowing us to learn those particular skills, but you have to be really particular about the sorts of skills that you want to learn. Um, and I do think also that like, you know, right, learn better is really a function of preparing people for the sorts of um, tasks that they're going to be doing in the future. Um, with an example like coding, uh, right, coding will change uh, quite a lot, right, as a result of, um, yeah. Uh, as a result of generative AI tools, I I don't have a solid sense of what it like in in five years and ten years. Um, um, but really embracing that changing process, I think, will be a really important part of understanding. Well, what precisely are the tasks that we should be preparing people to do? Um, okay, that's my my try. Do you do you want to respond at all, Sarah? Or we also have more questions for you as well. I, I think I mean I think so. You're talking about learning better. It, it, to some degree in terms of what what to learn and then maybe to add to that would be a way of thinking about the 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 experience of learning i'm thinking a little bit because i'm i'm wrapped up in in uh language arts and reading and writing right now of a a, a scholar and educator named louise rosenblatt who um studied poetry and teaching uh literature and she had this kind of continuum that she used to describe the process of reading 
And on one end of the continuum was something she called efferent reading, which is uh, reading to take something away, to take information away, which we need to do and, and enjoy doing. And then on the other end of the continuum was something she called aesthetic reading, which was the moment by moment experience of creating meaning and enjoying or finding fulfilling that experience. And she argued that in school contexts, at least, we're very much focused on the efferent. And she, all her life, argued to kind of push students and teachers in classrooms more towards that aesthetic reading experience. And I think one way of thinking about learning better is the uh, learning uh, in a more fulfilling, pleasurable way. And that would mean uh, the moment to moment experience of uh, having curiosity, exploring to fulfill that curiosity, coming up against some kind of barrier. I know you're super into the, the suffering for the art, you know, um, uh, I'm less into that, but I hear you. So, you know, bumping up against an, an obstacle, tinkering around to figure your way around that obstacle, feeling fulfilled again, feeling more curiosity and so on. So that, so then the question becomes to what degree does, might AI um, assist in that kind of more, let's call it aesthetic learning. And I don't, I think part of the thing that you're saying is that if, if, if AI makes things too easy or if it augments too much, then you'd miss that bumping up against, you'd miss the curiosity and you'd miss the, the tinkering. Yeah, Miss, I think to your point, kind of the a consequence of experience of learning and that, and that consequence being that aesthetic dimension of, of learning, which I think for me, I don't know about the rest of you, the reason I have for doing almost anything, again, I'm a chaotic person who, a computer scientist who does computer music, the reason I feel like I'm most motivated to do anything is, is actually an aesthetic reason. You know, there, it's everything when I realize there's a there's a beauty in doing a certain thing, then I'm all in. And and there's nothing more powerful for me as a personal motivator to actually do things, whether it's like playing a difficult video game to or learning a new thing or like or learning an instrument. You know, I didn't think I have I didn't have that with the accordion, which I showed, but I had that with the electric guitar at the age of 13, which is like, I got to learn this. That's got to play the solo, the stairway to heaven. I got to just do that because that solo is awesome. So like that kind of working backwards from this is what I thought would be like a sublime experience what has always been very powerful. But so maybe this is to take away kind of what the two of you are saying. And this is post the notes, at least in my brain, but also I want to kind of post it out there. It seems like there are certainly these two different, but perhaps not contradictory ways of looking. One is a task-oriented way of thinking, you know, what to learn based on what someone who's educated might be expected, that kind of task that might be expected to perform in life, in work, or just in life. And the other is the kind of moment-to-moment -moment experiential um, aesthetics-driven side of learning. And I don't have any answers, but I wonder, I, in this case, I do wonder what a what a like a not an average but like a radical synthesis between these two different goals might look like that's just a post a note i'll put out there um i guess sarah some of the things that that you brought up raise a few related questions that we had been thinking about um one is like how i mean and, and this question i think has come up often with all the new tools is is how we measure learning and assessment like will that change over time with ai tools um mm -hmm. I, <laughs> uh, i've been studying um a couple of things one is ai and writing and the other is the assessment of uh literary reading and writing and you know and this is all in school context because in everyday context we assess by saying things like did you like it? Or, oh, would you read another one? Or, oh, tell me what you think. Um, in school context, we assess in a more efferent way. So in terms of assessing in what we might think of as kind of a, a, um, a academic assessment, we are already, at least in the K-12 um, area where I'm most concerned, already assessing in a kind of a robotic way. 
we're already assessing in a way where um, a, a chat bot would be very successful. And, so and they, they are, are successful. Su yeah, that's right. That's right. They are successful. Yeah. Um, good for you, chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> they can pass like the, the law school exam and all that. They can pass the law school exam. Um, so I don't... <laughs> If we were to continue down the road, we're continuing when it comes to writing with AI, we wouldn't need to change our assessments at all. Um, and then a computer could write it and a computer could assess it and um, the rest of us could sit back maybe and have a more aesthetic, you know, reading or writing experience. So I don't, I think in that way, assessment wouldn't have to change. But of course, we would prefer that we're using AI to, to, to augment and to challenge. Um, and if that's if that's what we're aiming for, then I think actually assessment will have to become uh, more creative and more authentic and more more real world, I guess, whatever babies in the basement, real world, whatever that means. <laughs> so, so we're kind of on a at a at a little on the fence right now. I guess a couple a couple mm -hmm. thought, thoughts on that. I mean, one one is certainly like uh, um, you know, I, I, like assessment is certainly going to need to change uh, as we're adapting to the adoption of these sorts of new tools, like um, um, whether it's writing or coding, um, the way that we're doing tests will, will change and, and we'll need to adapt to that. I think that there's, so that's the kind of, you know, an urgency, right? But then there's, there's also a, a great opportunity in assessment with these sorts of things. Um, you know, I, I, for instance, been talking with a lot of people about like using AI uh, to uh, make group learning not bad. Um, right. Like what, what if you, what if like, you know, if, if this could, if this process could make, uh, the sorts of group learning assignments that, that ordinarily seem very, like very tedious, uh, in early education into a process that could be more, more fulfilling. Um, like how, well, how would that like work? having, like, uh, uh, you know, have an, inserting an, uh, an artificial agent in the process and maybe they are, uh, helping things run a bit more smoothly or helping people who are, um, who uh, might be having difficulty speaking up, um, you know, get a little bit more of the limelight. Um, I think that there is like all, all sorts of things we can do to try to, um, you know, to try to, um, uh, you know, to, to try to make this process a more a more fulfilling one. Um, and uh, and in doing so, um, there, there's like very different sorts of assessments we can uh, we can introduce uh, by by having these kind of systems in the loop. Could I, I wonder if I could just jump in because one of the, I, I think a lot about group projects as well. And if you've been to school in the US, you probably have some recollection of what a group project was like, maybe in elementary or middle school. And maybe you're in a language arts classroom, you know, you get into a small group and one person is a recorder and one person reports out and one person draws a picture really for no reason. And, um, <laughs> and, I, I, and and sometimes those group projects really are really stultifying. Um, and then there is a person who doesn't talk because they, you know, would rather not. And maybe they're not so interested in what's yeah. going on. And I've always thought that the solution to that is to be uh, putting people in groups for reasons and giving them a goal that is, you know, challenging enough and interesting enough and motivating enough that you won't need a reporter and you won't need because people will be interested in working together on a particular project about which they're actually genuinely curious. And so in a way, you could see how using AI to make that process better without fixing what my guess is, is the root of the problem, which is we're putting you into a group because we know small groups are supposed to be good for learning, but I'm yeah. still asking you a question that's pretty academic, mm -hmm. both literally and metaphorically. So we bring in the AI and the AI, the AI, the AI facilitates right um but doesn't but doesn't fix right right no i think that's a, it's a it's a really important point um that that like you know, uh fundamentally you you I mean yeah, you can you can make these tools to make it a smoother process perhaps and um but but perhaps fundamentally you need to you know fix the underlying motivation behind doing it Right, right, right. And the AI could make us focus a little bit m more perhaps inappropriately on the cosmetic features of you know interaction as opposed to the the, the drives, yeah, the original drives that should lead us to want to explore and learn. Yeah, no, absolutely. 
So, so this is super interesting because Sarah, because I, it, it's actually for me, it's from you that I, I kind of learned when when I learned that you ha you were working with have using something like you know LLMs, large language models, to actually help classrooms generate prompts rather than say like answering prompts. And and I think it speaks to kind of what we're talking about here is that kind of there's a difference in learning when it comes to like the process versus kind of the results, right? And I wonder if you if you wanted to say more on this this idea because it's I guess what I'm getting at is this. I'm looking at the kind of this generation of AI where we are in our world, and I'm thinking like actually like the way what I what I really want from AI is very, very domain specific. Like if AI could help us move the needle, I don't know, on like say climate science, I'd be like, we'll take the results if the results are there, right? Or if AI could with curation with medical professionals to say like if AI can help actually achieve measurably better results, I'd be probably inclined to be like if, if the medical professionals are there and this actually clearly solves something that needs solved, I'd be inclined to do that when it comes to say the arts, it's much more hazy. Because then this like whole like suffering before the arts thing to make art what it is actually becomes very relevant. And then and then education which seems to sit kind of almost like encompassing all of the above. And that as we're getting at, I think there's a, a big amount of, I guess the, the, I guess I'll call it doing the task oriented part of learning. It's like, you got to learn so you can learn to do something. But then you're also talking about the, the being part of learning, which is such an important part of learning because that's what makes us, I think, learn in one hand, on one hand, also enjoy learning. So, this is all circling back to kind of something I feel like, Sarah, I learned from you once upon a time is that like kind of using AI not to generate like pass the exam, but so much to give us the questions that we might then generate answers ourselves. I want to comment to, you know, you mentioned ed education sits in this middle ground. I, I'm not sure. And maybe like, maybe you two have opinions as well. There's just so many inequalities in our education system. And like, there's just so many issues and, um, like assessments themselves, like we they we know that they haven't worked for like a very long time. So I kind of feel like AI is in that climate science place. In terms of, for example, like elevating, say, access to... Elevating access. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, many things. I'm, I, I guess I feel like maybe that's, for me, it's like if, if AI does help elevate access, I might, again, I'm being more inclined, but then... I guess at what point do we draw a kind of, do we shift over to, I guess it's forever this, I mean, it's like, it's like the human condition, right? I think we, this is again going, probably going too much into Gus personal philosophy here, but like, I feel like, you got a 12 week old, so, you know. Okay, maybe it's a time to philosophize. I'm looking at human beings, I'm looking at like 12 year, 12 week old, like infants, and I'm just thinking about the life ahead of her. Um, how much of that is going to, stuff that she's got to do. And I think everyone here, there's stuff that you got to do that the world wants from you, right? But then there's the other side, which is like that, that aesthetic dimension, which is like the thing that makes life worth living. <laughs> and, and I feel like as humans, it's like we are forever working within that balance between the doing and the being. And, but at the same time, like the way that society and, and assessment education, for example, the way that often that tends to trend is more towards the like doing at the sometimes at the expense of being. And I feel like, again, this is goes philosophizing here, but I feel like I don't want to live in that world because I feel like that world, like the more we live in that world, the more we are the danger of dehumanizing ourselves. When you take away the being, but at the same time, you can't forget the doing either. Cause like, it's like my parents, you know, my, when I was going to college, my dad was like, "Guh, you should go follow your interest, but do it in a way where you can also stand on your own two feet. As in like, you can support yourself, get a job, but within that, like learn to, to find your, so sorry for the long philosophizing, but that's kind of what all this is. I'll stop talking. <laughs> yeah, I just feel like there's a lot of opportunities in education. Um, it's just about finding the right like root cause. And if 
AI is the solution to that, like, you know, group projects, like is AI the solution or is there some other solution, but it could be the solution for many. I think it could be, it could be, I mean, we'll call A, we'll call it B, right? I think AI has the power to um, democratize uh, various experiences, um, um, but, you know, fundamentally it can't, you can't use it to pave over big existing root causes. I, mean, <laughs> I, I, I think that uh, when, we, when we talk about education, we often think education within the confines of an institution, as opposed to education broadly, that is people are learning all over the place, people are educating themselves, being educated. On the, on the bike path, for example, I learned that you should not walk in the bike path. Um, and that was a kind of a behavioralist kind of learning, but it's happening outside the institutional walls. I think now it, you are thinking about AI in a much broader way. I'm thinking about it within the confines of, a, of, of an institution. And I think in, in that way, it's a little easier because I've got more constraints, um, but it's also a little harder because the constraints that I'm working within are so... Uh, or, or are often quite oppressive and quite kind of reductive. So when I think about AI as a, um, an augmenter and something that might lead to equity in education, I'm thinking about things like um, a chatbot can act as someone with whom, a, an entity with whom you can dialogue um, when you don't have anyone else to talk to. And that might be to figure out an idea or it might be for, for, for mental health uh, uh, support. Um, but I'm not thinking about kind of learning more generally. Um, so yeah, I, I don't, I, I don't know which world. I don't know which world. I guess both. I guess it's all in the maybe. There's a fun, a little. Uh, I, I was just talking with someone yesterday about uh, about her. Uh, she's got her 11 uh, uh, year old daughter who has now convinced herself that she wants to be a neuroscientist um, in, in the future, and and uh, uh, she was using. Uh, chat GPT to um, to give to, to propose for the daughter science experiments that she do <laughs> right which, like, which she the the parent might not have been able to parent might not have not been able to do herself she's not a neuroscientist she doesn't any have any idea mm -hmm. um, uh, of course there's questions about like in, is, is doing a good job at, at generating those things mm -hmm. but um, you know in in their experience it was actually pretty great it, it was this new way of um, taking cultural knowledge and turning it into something which is accessible to this 11 year old who's really curious about some topic. Yeah, that's super cool. I think we should, we need to be thinking more about that and less about my daughter, for example, who's in uh, college and don't worry, it, you still know nothing, turns out after 20 years. <laughs> um, in fact, you know less even, cause then they're like, you know, nothing. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, for her, it's ChatGPT is a way to summarize an article, yeah. or you know, or a way to um, condense something that she's written from a thousand to five hundred words. And again, that's within the confines of this institution uh, of school that demands things that are you know kind of artificial. Whereas using ChatGPT to explore something you're truly curious about is it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I also like the notion in like hard, but maybe eventually be a good thing that, um, you know, that, that perhaps because certain artificial things are, are suddenly very easy, we will stop doing a bit more. We'll stop doing... We'll stop having the, uh, more artificial science. Right, right, right. I mean, ideally, something like a chatbot will force education to rethink, you know, why it teaches, what it teaches, since so much of what it teaches can now be... Uh, regurgitated through a chatbot ideally um we're not yeah i mean when <laughs> when something like chat gpt emerged in november 2022 you might remember many school systems banned it immediately because the first place they went was this is a cheat bot now a couple of years later uh, a lot of those schools and institutions are rethinking exactly what their relationship to something like chat gpt should be and there is, there's lots of exciting things that it could do, including helping a kid who, let's say, in terms of writing, um, is is not maybe the uh, is not a great writer, is emerging in terms of their skills as a writer, and 
gives their writing to ChatGPT, asks ChatGPT to edit it. Some of the research I'm doing right now involves what do kids take up when they ask a chatbot to edit their work. ChatGPT edits their work. Uh, the kids looks at the edit and says, oh, they've taken all my personality out of this writing. Like they've made it really flat. And one kid said robotic. And uh, I think without something like ChatGPT, they may not have even realized that they had a voice that was not flat and robotic. So there are parts of what AI can do that might make you realize how much you, how human you are. And that's exciting too. There's a distinction I think there in like in making something, whether it's an essay or whether it's 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 art, um, in like making making a thing and making your thing. Right. Right. right, and, right. And there there is there is the the productive act of making of making that which you want or the, the something that is yours. Um, and that's, that's, I think, something that's getting conflated a lot in conversation with like, oh, just having something that generates something that kind of sort of looks like something. Exactly. And using the robot to determine what, what you don't want, which is a kind of learning too. contrasting cases. It's not this, 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 or this. I'm not quite sure why. Let me look at the commonalities between these. Oh, they all sound like robots. I don't want to sound like a robot. Now I've learned something about myself. So I think this is a great play. We're almost at time. We want to take a few questions. Um, I really love this ending conversation. Um, I, get, I do think we had one in the audience and then I'll take one from online as well. <laughs> oh, uh, the, oh yeah, we'll do. Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead with the brown hat. Um, hi, um, <clears throat> so this is kind of like a, Thank you so much um, for all of this. Um, so I wrote my questions down. Um, it's sort of like a threaded question. Yeah. So I have I have a background in uh, education and in music, and so um, I was thinking about ages and like um, from like three to seven is such a tender, malleable age in terms of. Pardon. Oh, it's just such Ever a malleable, malleable age in terms of, 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 of the sponge years and then from one to three and all of the stages and then even thinking about yeah, just all of that. So, so, so my big question of like helping, I just realized I'm talking in front of people and I got scared, but <laughs> my, my question is just the word feeling hasn't come up yet. And I think it's the feeling of like, um, let me, it's, it's just that feeling of like, you know, you said, you know, oh, are we all robots? And that made me think about um, what's the difference between us and robots, the feeling, the heart, the soul. And then that's the soul of music, which is the voice and the channeling that sort of, sort of, that musicians and artists really kind of third eye it. and a robot, as much as we can mirror it, can you mirror a feeling versus can you mirror and is feeling then a habit and is feeling then data or is feeling a, a, like a response versus a reactive? I mean, it kind of interlaces between data and what we're collecting versus the natural um, response of being human and how and then, and then what are the safety parameters? And I think it's some, I think maybe law you mentioned. And I think that's where law can kind of step in about how do we how do we keep the soul of us safe while also helping like this this um, education about connecting more with kids with autism, which I also worked with kids with autism for a while. And so that I was like, oh my god! And then maybe we can do that with my dog. Okay, anyway, <laughs> thank you so much. So it's sort of a blah, 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 but I do want to, yes. just before we go to our, our, our guests for, for their thoughts, I do want to point out that aesthetics feeling, did, I think, did come up because I think the aesthetics I think we're talking about here isn't like kind of cosmetics, of course. It's aesthetics as the consequence of experience, aesthetics. And I think, another, that's, I think for me, at least that's another word for feeling, but I, I love what, what you said pointing that out of like, I think maybe... We, you were also coming into the same room here in terms of thinking about that aesthetic dimension of learning. So I just want to point that out. 
Could you talk more about the 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 glasses that give you information about yeah. uh, others' feelings? Mm -hmm. How does that? How does it? When I take in that information, yeah. you're not asking me to feel any more than I might ordinarily feel, but you're giving me information about others' feelings. So how does yeah. it work? Uh, yeah, I mean, in, in that context, and, and I, you know, I, I guess I've put more thoughts a, a about this. Um, uh, but but let me let me start with this. Like in that um, in that context, like like okay, we um, you know we we, we ran some trials to suggest to to uh, uh, determine some level of efficacy. We saw some signal in that, which was which was great. Um, we didn't really unpack the precisely the mechanism of, of learning in the process. But if I were to guess. Um, or you know, guess is based on a, you know a lot of anecdotal evidence, and actually having run this study, um, what was helping out there in that process was that we were um, giving people a tool that would give you feedback, um, and it wasn't necessarily the feedback itself was like extremely instructive, but rather that it gave people a space to um, have conversations where they paid attention to emotions. Um, it sort of it, it basically said, okay, here's this. Here's this fun toy. Um, uh, now connect with each other, and if I it, and that's kind of my hypothesis for how they sort of the, the, it enabled um, this this uh, broader process of learning that that uh, uh, um, that is a regular part of, of our lives. It kind of it helped unlock that for some. And did they find that fulfilling? Was it a little unsettling? Mm. Did they did they would they use it again? Yeah, I think I mean you know I I I I'm I'm kind of like reading into anecdotes in, in, in this and in describing it. And so you know your mileage may vary certainly in making these sorts of things, but um you know the the goal of that system was to be a fairly unobtrusive thing, which gave you some some feedback. And I think uh, in people who were really successful with it, what it really um, did was it it seemed to unlock some genuine genuine connection that wasn't really particularly attached to the device. Huh. Um, and that that's the domain which I think is helpful. That sounds good. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean that that that's sort of I, I think that that's sort of like what we want to zero in uh, in follow up work. Yeah. So it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I should say, I mean, you know, maybe it's another point. I think Sarah, Sarah did a really fantastic job of bringing out something which I, you know, uh, didn't really emphasize so much in, in mind, which uh, in in what I was describing, um, that like that I think fundamentally one of the things that we want to do in understanding something like intrinsic motivation and understanding uh, uh, the drive that the child has early in life is building learning experiences that um, reinforce that process, that reinforce uh, exploration, discovery, and building. Um, and right, while we might not have artificial systems which are like going to you know, mimic all the feelings that we have in, in, in that, um, uh, in, in those processes, um, perhaps we can perhaps we can help people um, uh, reinforce that these are that these are good things that these are good drives that they should be carrying forward uh, as they learn more and more. So I I think we're going to keep taking questions, uh, but we have just a Vanessa and I have one more thing we want to share with you. Two more things actually. I mean I think we have so many questions here. Um, probably actually going to skip over this and uh, maybe I forgot these aren't here. Yeah, well. Yeah, we were just talking about um, yeah, our experience in education. So this is yeah, Emmett at 11 months and then Emmett learning letters. Um, yeah, so we talked about reading and he's currently learning how to re uh, recognize his name. I'm not sure he can read his name, but he learns the E and the M and thinks it's Emmett. So Emily's, they also look like Emmett's. But... I mean, there's the questions about like right now, like my child can't even obviously can't even like say anything other than ah and uh um but like this question of language learning and everything else is going to come up really soon as well as all the other kinds of learning um i thought before we go back to questions i i we prepared like uh one more and we'll call this a, maybe a palate cleanser because i have no idea what this next thing means but it's a video i took uh like a month ago this is when my daughter's at two months i decided to play her um some music. And I'm a computer scientist who works with AI, who works with computer music, but this thing's got no AI in it. It's got no coding in it. It's got like an acoustic instrument, but uh, I don't know what this means. Whoops. <laughs> Thank you. 
at least I kept her quiet for like a minute. Yay. Yeah. So, um, again, I don't know what this means, but I thought it would be a, a good palate cleanser. Um, <laughs> but I, I, it does make me think a lot, right, about I think these questions remain. And I, I, before we go back to questions, just I think what what do we really want from AI in education, What be it early childhood, be it kind of education, institutional education, be it beyond the institution. And that's that's a question I think we, I mean, I, I feel like it's the goal of our vodcast is to kind of pose this question. That's something we would invite all of you to think about for yourselves. If you have kids, think about for your kids. If you have students, think about for your students. And uh, Vanessa, anything else to add? I don't think so. Um, yeah, join us next time. I think that's a good place to end. Um, and then, yeah, the folks in the room, um, if we want to still do a few questions, we can do that. Okay. Maybe we'll think. Yes, and thank our guests, of course. This should go without saying. Thank you to our guests. <laughs> Any more questions? Um, hi. Uh, uh, there are a few different words get used around education. There's education, there's literacy, there's learning, right? Learning really is lifelong, continuous. So how do you even approach that? Because I think that contextuality is everything in how doesn't matter whether it's AI, no AI, foundationally speaking, whether I'm using human agents to do that or uh, AI agents to do that. Effectively, we are a human and AI agent environment already. That's pretty much doing that. And what does it even mean to have whoever is engaged in my well-being of learning is available to me 24 hours, just when the thought occurs, you're ready. And that's why AI is already massively, significantly, exponentially amazing in terms of being that continuous companion where I can bounce off things and has depth of knowledge and breadth of knowledge that no human would ever suffice already at this point. So how do you contextualize? Is education a word still relevant at all in this context? Uh, when learning is it's personalized highly, it's continuous, like every second, my mind is already at it, subconsciously or consciously. How do you bring that about and then get that clarity so you can go further and further in the inquiry process? So what's that your question. take on that context, long and short context, where it's not about education or literacy, it's about a continuous learning process? I'm going to limit the questions to six at a time, please. Uh, feel free to answer any of those if you like. I, I think when you say education, you're talking more about formal education. Is that right? So, modalities? But I don't think they should be. I think we just, we use the term education to think formally, whereas if you called, you know, I'm going to get my learning, you know, or I'm going to that building where learning happens, you know, that would be, ideally, they're the same. So I think the, the role of maybe formal education is what it's always been, which is you know, very flawed and human, but it is a decision about what do we as a society think is most worth turning our students' attention to, um, whether they use AI or not to explore whatever those things are. That's, that's what part of what schools or formal education's job is, is the is the what and the how and the AI can can participate but can't decide. I mean, I think I think um, you know one. Uh, I, I just had a, a little thought to, to that, which is um, you know if um, as technologists, one one opportunity that I think we have, and I and it sort of came up when we were talking about, oh, wouldn't it be great if AI forced education to kind of change how they do assessment? Um, uh, one thing that we can hope to do is to, to be building in a direction of, okay, well, how can we make um, this formal education process more like this lifelong learning process or really embracing and enabling this lifelong learning process uh, more than it more than it currently is for institutions? 
Yeah, and if part of what the part of the problem with institutionalized education is that it's just it's set up to fail. You know, it's just not natural to learn in a room of thirty or thirty-five, um, and to try to kind of move in lockstep from one thing to another. Um, AI can certainly make learning more individualized, which is what teachers have been attempting to do forever with great difficulty since how can you with 35 people in your classroom? So I think AI plays a role in making education more like learning. Uh, and it, depending on how, of course, depending on how we use it. We'll do another audience question. Yep, right back there in the maroon. Hi. So. Um... First question is uh, more on that uh, the application of those glasses. Uh, had you thought of um, supplying them to, say, people on the autistic spectrum and letting them uh, 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 then be able to learn to identify these emotional uh, um, characteristics of? of social interactions. And the other part, other question I thought maybe throw it out is that maybe intelligence is something like that of, uh, of being a spectrum and that we should be in the future, including what we now think of as silicon um, intelligences. And they could also be, they are also on this intelligent spectrum i mean i can i can start by answering the um the the, the question about the google glass project and, and yeah the, the the primary uh um population that we were working with was uh was uh children on the autism spectrum um um and um you know as i said i don't think that the that the device was necessarily like teaching them uh you know specific recognition skills but rather rather um uh, hopefully at least in a, in a and uh, in, in many sub cases, um, uh, enabling this sort of practice at certain kind of socialization that that enables you know, very natural learning of of, uh, of connection with people. Um, and yeah, yeah, that that was sort of the primary demographic we were we were going after. And then the second question was about uh, talking about AI in terms of a spectrum of intelligence. Did you say? Yeah, it, we should maybe be thinking of intelligence as being on a spectrum just as autism is a spectrum and uh and that would also maybe apply to human intelligence as that uh and so those, those babies in the basement are maybe just <laughs> on a different level but and they have experiences which are kind of limited right so uh -huh. Babies in the basement. Um, I, 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 I'm not I, building babies in the basement. I want to make that very clear. That's somehow <laughs> we want to make. We don't know. We don't know what they're saying. <laughs> Silica, something, something. Babies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to kind of do dodge the that the question of spectrum for for AI, but I will say that one of the models of intelligence and knowledge that education uh, scholars work with and that we all work with is the idea of distributed intelligence. That is that I'm smarter with that phone in my hand where I can write down my question than I am without it. And the I think the the, the kind of existential question for us is, is AI just another tool in our toolbox of distributed resources or is it something that's gonna um actually end up constraining us and i i, I optimist i'm feeling fairly optimistic that it is another resource to distribute our intelligence to but like i said with the you know the babies it's hard to know we'll I, see. I firmly believe that yeah like the, that the ai that we're building right now is really something that um Right, like our, our colleague Roy P talks about, like cognitive reorganization. Right, mm -hmm. uh, you gain um, this, which I think is very, very intertwined with the notion of distributed intelligence. That you, um, you know, as with writing, you, you know, when, when people learn how to write, that really changed um, how they interacted with the world because it enabled um, you to do all sorts of new things with uh, what, uh, what, how it meant, to, uh, uh, how, what it meant to uh, uh, use your memory um, and what you should be using your memory for. Um, what you could do, you could be using, yeah, what you could be using your memory for, and 
I think we are potentially again at a point where we're designing a, a new cognitive tool that um, can uh, enable people to do very different sorts of tasks that they than, than they did before, um, and that's uh, an exciting. I think it's, there's a good question as to you know are we are we making a new a new writing? Are we making a new calculator? Are we making a new spreadsheet? Or is it yeah? Or is it very limited? Um, and that's a, a right. Will it be a, a player piano, which we now only press a button to right. do music as opposed to create ourselves? Yeah. I think we'll wrap up in this part, but we'll inform you if you have a question or discussions, um, I think we'll feel free to come on up and if you like. And uh, so maybe we'll call for one more round of applause for, for our guests and all of you for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you.